Welcome. In today's lesson, we'll be discussing the why of programming by reviewing mnemonics and having a discussion that relates to the following topics. Our first topic is going to be debugging. We're going to talk about what a bug is, the difference between bugs and features in the surprisingly gray area, and then we're going to talk about what the action of debugging actually looks like. Then we're going to move over to something called the stack trace. We're going to talk about what that is, how to read the stack trace, and what it means. We'll talk about exceptions. What are exceptions? We'll talk about the difference between a syntax error and an exception. And then to follow up on that, we'll talk about exception handling. We'll talk about what that means, why it's different from regular exceptions. And we'll talk about the keywords raise and finally. We'll talk about what the keyword raise actually does and what the keyword finally actually does. So remember that there's only 12 giant pandas in captivity in the United States. It's really not that many. So our first mnemonic today is going to be a wonderful ladybug, and it's going to represent the topic in general of debugging. And the reason I chose the ladybug for our mnemonic is because it has the word bug in its name, and it is a bug. It's double bugged, just like some of your code might be. So what is a bug? Well, a software bug is an error, flaw, failure, or fault in a computer program, or its system that causes it to produce an incorrect or unexpected result, or maybe even just to behave in unintended ways. And because unintended ways can be hard to define, it's the same reason why bugs and features come in many shades of gray. If you don't clearly define the functionality that you want to achieve, sometimes a bug becomes a feature or a feature becomes a bug. So what is the action of debugging? Well, Debugging is the process of smoothing out these bugs or replacing the parts that are broken. Once you have a clear definition of the functionality you want, when that functionality always occurs, you have a bug-free code. But it'll almost never happen because there's so many use cases that you can't predict. So debugging is a spectrum, and it can be easy. It can be as simple as a print command that prints a variable at a certain point in the program, and you notice that it's wrong and make a quick fix. Or it can be as complicated as introducing new complex debugging code, which just tests for subtle changes between your expected outputs and your true outputs. And there can be so many layers to this, both nested inside of functions, inside of functions, or in simple decision tree style complexity, where you have conditionals that are layered on top of each other. So there's a big spectrum to debugging. So our next mnemonic is going to be a giant Jenga, and it's going to represent the topic of a stack trace. And the reason I chose this giant Jenga game is because the process of playing that game, Jenga, is sort of similar to a stack trace in the sense that we're looking up and down this pile, right? We're analyzing which pieces can be separated, which pieces can be moved, and we're guessing how that's going to affect the balance of the overall structure. And in the same way, we're looking up and down this code, trying to imagine how it's going to affect the overall output. So what is a stack trace? Well, a stack trace is a report. It's a report at certain points in time during the execution of a program. So it's going to take each line like a step. And we're going to be able to see a list of the method calls that the application was in the middle of when the error occurred, aka an exception was thrown. So let's talk about how to read the stack trace, because not every bug will have a stack trace, but many do. And if they do, this means that the bug's not on the surface level of your code, but instead it's wrapped up deeper down. And by deeper down, I mean that the order of the code that it's compiled in has different layers to it. And our bug might not be on the top surface layer. So it could be deeper in scope, like inside of a function, or it could be deeper in the source modules being imported. So instead of starting at the top of our code, we just start with our topmost method call. And then often, this will get our attention close enough to the problem that we can work through the rest. So our next mnemonic is going to be China's red flag. And the reason why this represents the topic of exceptions is because it's literally a big red flag that you can remember. And exceptions should be thought of as red flags that need to be addressed. So what is an exception? Well, imagine if somebody passed in a string argument when your function only works with integers. Exception handling is how you deal with this. So what's the difference between a syntax error and an exception? 
Well, syntax errors, which are also known as parsing errors, these are syntax problems. And I think of them similar to just misspellings or typos. You probably just type something in wrong. And if you look closer, you'll see that you're missing a semicolon or something like that. But even if a statement or expression is syntactically correct, it may still cause an error. And in those cases, you have an exception. And the reason I chose this for the mnemonic is because in the same way that a practical joke works, exception handling is all about bringing attention to the unexpected. So what is exception handling? Well, exception handling is about making sure that we have variables that don't break our code in some way. So this is going to be similar to how we had our conditional section before. We're going to want to do exceptions to make sure that our variables are what we expect they are at the right times. Exception handling is a process of responding to an unwanted action during either the compile time or the runtime, which we'll talk about in a second. So we're going to want to know a couple keywords for this, specifically the keywords try and accept. Going back to the conditionals, these are very similar. Pythos gives us these conditional type keywords to help us find where our code goes wrong in the sense of a variable not being what we expect it to be. Let's zoom in on this try keyword. So kind of like our conditional that had an if statement where we could say is something equal to some variable, our try statement is going to check to see if the exception is the type that it expects. So remember, when we have an exception, there is already a type that it can have. When we downloaded Python, many of these exceptions already exist. We can add a few more, but there's already dozens and dozens that come with Python. So that's what we're going to be checking for. And we have a few options. We can try with no exception. We can try with a match type. So the exception we get matches the one that we're telling it to look for. Or we can try with a type mismatch, meaning if it's anything except the one that we want. So let's talk about trying using the keyword try with no exception. So first, the statement between the try and the accept keywords are executed. You know, Probably be able to see this better in the next video when we're actually looking at code examples, but you can imagine it a lot like our if statement from before. And then if no exception occurs, the accept clause is skipped entirely. And the execution of the try statement, it's finished. Then we also have try with a type match. So in this case, if an exception occurs during the execution, the rest of the clause is skipped. And then if it's type matches the exception named after the accept keyword, the accept clause is executed. And then the execution continues after the try statement. And then finally, there's try with a type mismatch. And sort of the opposite to the others, if an exception occurs which does not match the exception type named in the accept clause, then it's passed on. I feel like... I feel like you'll probably understand that better in the next lesson. So even though I said the things right, I think it's like all over the place until you sort of see the spacing and stuff. So roll with it in the next video. So now let's talk about a couple more keywords that go along with that. And we're going to use the mnemonic of a cosplay woman raising her sword. And it's going to represent raise and finally. Two more keywords that we're going to use for debugging. And the reason I chose her as the mnemonic is because when you see someone looking at you, and then they raise that sword, you know something's wrong. And these will tell you something's wrong too. Just these are exceptions. That one means you're going to get killed. OK, so what does the keyword raise do? Let's focus in on that one first. So raise is a way to override the default exceptions in a way that we want. So what does the raise keyword do? So let's focus in on that. Now, the raise keyword is a way to override the default exceptions in any way that we want. So we can display information that we need to to other developers and to users. So I mean, in a nutshell, raise just allows us to define our own type of exception errors. And really, you don't need this too often. Python has the main ones already built in. But every once in a while, you have a special use case where it's good to know that you can do this. Now, how about the keyword finally? What does that do? Well, we can use the finally statement to ensure that a block of code is closed at the end of the file, even if there is an exception that causes the interpreter to break. So we have something that stops right in the middle of the code, but we still need the code to jump to the bottom and close something up or release something to make sure that it actually is pulled away in the correct way. Kind of, I kind of imagine like on your computer when you like pull out a USB stick without clicking the thing and it's like, ah, like that's the way you can think about this. So times when you might want to do something like this is when you need to close out an open file at the very end of your program or something like that. 
And for a final mnemonic, I want to group together some of these exceptions into runtime and compile time exceptions. So our mnemonic, a marathon runner, and I chose a marathon runner for the runtime and compile time because a marathon runner is keeping track of their run times, like on their watch. And then I also think of the compile time as maybe the big uh, number thing that you'll see at the end of like runners, their big finish line number, you know. Um, and also, I kind of think compile time sounds similar to a mile time, so you might want to think of it that way too, but that's up to you. So now let's talk about grouping these errors into two different groups, one for runtime and one for compile time. Now, starting with compile time, this is when we're first executing the code on our end, not when the user is actually using it. Compile time errors happen when we feed in a whole bunch of text to the compiler. It's reading the code that we just wrote, and it's converting it behind the scenes into machine code, ones and zeros. So these compile time errors are usually syntax errors, meaning we type something wrong. They're type checking errors, like where we use a variable that's, say, type string, but we're using it like it's a type integer and it doesn't know what to do. And then in rare occasions, like never happened to me, but when I read the documentation, it said it happened, there's compiler crashes where you just have to like shut your IDE down or the Jupyter Notebook breaks in our situation. Okay, and then there's also the runtime errors, and these are the errors that will be used when somebody else brings up our program. And there could be, say, a division by zero, meaning somebody put a zero into our code from the user end and it did something weird, broke, gave us an error. Great staying with me on this lesson. So let's end with a quick summary of the mnemonics that we just learned and the concepts that they represent. Now our first mnemonic was a ladybug and it represented the topic of debugging in general. We learned that bugs are pieces of code that produce unexpected results. We learned that bugs and features come in many shades of gray. And we learned that debugging is the process of smoothing out these bugs once you have a clear definition of the functionality that you want. Next, we learned the mnemonic of a giant Jenga set, and it represented the topic of a stack trace. And a stack trace is a report, and this report can point to different points in time as the computer compiles our code, and some different techniques to read this stack trace and understand it. And our next mnemonic was a giant Jenga, and it represented the topic of a stack trace. And we learned that a stack trace is a report, and it's a report that talks to us about our code in different points in time as it moves its way down the code from top to bottom. And then we talked about some of the techniques to look at the stack trace and get some intuition about what might have gone wrong. Then we learned the mnemonic of China's big red flag, which represented the topic of an exception. And we learned that exceptions occur even when we have written our statements correctly. And it often has to do with what's inside of our variables. After that, we learned the mnemonic of one of those hand buzzers that like a clown would have or the joker. And it represented the topic of exception handling. It's how to handle those red flags. And we learned that exception handling is the process of responding to the unwanted actions, either during compile time or during runtime. And then we learned the mnemonic of a warrior princess as she raised her sword, and it represented the keyword raise and the keyword finally. And zooming in on them, we learned that raise is a way to override the default exceptions in any way that we want so we can display information that we need to the users and other programmers. And then we learned about the finally keyword, which lets us run a special block of code at the end of our file, which helps us either disconnect from a server or close out a file or something else that might cause a problem if we don't make it all the way through our code. And our final mnemonic was a marathon runner who was keeping track of their run time and also looking at their final time on the finish line. And this represented our runtime and compile time errors. So we learned some of the things that would happen at the different times and which kind of errors would be grouped into which ones. And then our final mnemonic was a marathon runner and he was keeping track of his runtime and then also his finish line time. And this represented our runtime and compile time errors. And then we talked about how different errors can fall into these two different groups. So I think we've had enough theory for now. Why don't we pull up our old trusty Jupyter Notebook and start looking at some of these examples in code. Subscribe to our Mnemonic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.